Thank you, Megan, I think. We'll see how it turns out. It's obvious to me that Matthew must have had some traumatic event happen in his childhood. The gnashing of the teeth phrase that he uses occurs seven times in the Bible, and five of them are in Matthew's Gospel. There is another version of this parable in Luke's Gospel. It's way more upbeat. There is no king, only a host. There are no slaves that are killed. There is no revenge and fire and fury. Biblical scholarship suggests that that indicates Luke's version was the original and that the gruesome touches that are added by Matthew came later. I told you I thought he had a rough childhood. This is pretty gruesome to us, but in Matthew's day, it would have been totally beyond belief. No one would refuse a king's invitation. You just didn't say no to a king. And you especially didn't seize his slaves and kill them. The king's response is the most believable part of this parable. A man of power and pride, he would not let himself be disrespected in this way without consequences. And there were consequences. When I read this parable in the past, I've always focused on the last four guest who was dressed wrong. I've always pictured him as a street person who perhaps has already had way too much to drink. He visualized him in dirty and ripped clothing. But after sitting with this parable for about the last 10 days, I have a, a different image. There's this palace. The king lives in it. It has huge iron gates connected to high stone pillars. And on the day of the king's son's wedding, the gates are flung open and throngs of people from all walks of life are passing through them into the courtyard. Music can be heard Roasting beef can be smelled. Now I picture this unfortunate one coming upon the scene, just following the crowd out of curiosity. He hasn't gone home to grab the right clothes. He doesn't even know it's a wedding. It's a party. He joins it. He's a party guy. Instead of focusing on what others are wearing, I bet he's salivating and trying to make his way to the bar. His luck continues, he thinks, when the king, the actual king, approaches him and calls him friend. He thinks that he has really lucked out. But it's obvious he doesn't know the reputation of this king, and he learns it way too late. Suddenly, the king's slaves grab him and bind him, and throw him into the outer darkness. I picture them standing on the edge of the globe, hurling this package out to where he is caught by the force that circulates around the globe. Like Charlie on the MTA, he is still there, wailing and gnashing what few teeth he has left. It's pretty easy to become distracted by this poor fellow and gloss over the initial group of guests and the destruction of their city. But they are a key part of this parable too. To begin, why did these guests say they were not coming? Why were they not coming? In Luke's version, they all have excuses and they all send their apologies. But there's not that in Matthew's. We don't hear any reason or even an apology. They just refuse to come. And when asked a second time, they are so annoyed, they kill the messengers. These people are more involved in their own lives, in what's going on in the moment. 
to stop long enough to take in what is being offered. These people were not honored by their invitation. They cannot imagine anything more engaging than what they are doing at the moment. We know here where Jesus is going with this parable. God has laid a banquet out for us to celebrate his son, but we'd rather go to McDonald's. Once, when our um, daughter Autumn was about two years old, we had one of those waxy glow sticks that you snap and then light starts to come out of them. Um, and they're really best to seen in the dark. We thought she would be really intrigued by this little transformation. So we brought her out on the deck late one night. It's plenty dark enough to get the effect. As we prepared to dazzle and amaze her with our 99 cent trinket, we tried to get her to focus on it. Look, Autumn, look, it lit up. Look, it's a nice bright yellow. Look, look. We, yeah, we said this over and over again, but Autumn would not look. She was yelling in wonder at the sky. The moon, the moon, she said as she looked up in wonder. No, Autumn, we said, look at this thing, this 99 cent piece of junk, look at this. She continued to point and call out the moon. And at some point, it hit us. Autumn knew the difference between a banquet and McDonald's. We didn't. It's sort of like that with these two sets of guests. I imagine the first group were wealthy and important people. After all, they were on the king's son's wedding guest list. They, no doubt, were not lacking food or comfort. Told of a banquet, they were not impressed, let alone honored. The second set of guests may well have contained wealthy and well-fed people. We do not know. What we do know is that they understood the moment, the sacred moment of a wedding, the celebratory moment of a feast. They quickly got their finest clothing, probably arranged from Dior to Goodwill, but meant for a wedding. They got dressed properly and hurried to the palace, except the last guy, who didn't even know where he was or why who, like the first invitees, was interested in what was in it for him with no regard for what was actually going on. Jesus sums it up for us in just a few words. For many are called, but few are chosen. Just what we are afraid of. The line in heaven is long but few get beyond the gates. Is that what Jesus is saying with this elaborate parable? If we're thinking about being tossed into the outer darkness, this parable seems extremely lopsided. Only one soul was rejected and treated in that form, but many, many were called, were invited. We quiver with fear of not being chosen, of being bound hand and foot, of God rejecting us. We read pronouncements like this and think, are we good enough? Will we be chosen or will we be found wanting? It's about God, but we like to make it about ourselves. God spreads a banquet before us. God spreads a banquet before us. God spreads a banquet before us. And we barely pay it any mind. We are not saying no to God. We are saying later. And then we go on and scurry around trying to scrape together enough for a snack. It is we who have chosen, chosen to put the banquet 
further down on our list of priorities, distancing ourselves from God's banquet, making it quite clear what our priorities are. It's a banquet. Does God really want us coming with a full stomach? It's a banquet of love and beauty, community of splendor that can arise in the most unusual and uh, unlikely of places. Places where one hand offers a bit of food to another, where one hand offers a comforting squeeze. It's a feast of being listened to, really listened to, a place of hearing, really hearing and understanding, of God's presence within us and God's strength with us. Many are called. The banquet is there, arrayed before you. Open your eyes. Look. God is yearning for us to be drawn to the sacred and divine, to let it into our souls so deeply that we couldn't possibly ignore it again. Ken Orth recites a poem about a peanut seller at the Grand Canyon. This guy's been selling peanuts there for years. He's got a table in front of him with all the little packets of peanuts piled up. He, the table is facing the roadway and he is standing behind it with his back to the canyon. And each day it's the same thing. Until one day, a customer comes and is carrying a mirror a mirror aimed at the canyon. And the peanut seller sees the beauty, the beauty he's been so close to for all this time. And he has not been, not seen it. He can't believe what he's been missing. Right there behind him. He immediately upends his table sends his peanuts flying and spends the rest of his days in awe at the splendor. I know, you might be thinking, what, is she nuts? Try being a parent, an employee, a teacher, a volunteer. It is easy these days to think we do not have time for awe at God's banquet. Our lives have become so unpredictable and difficult. We don't say no to God, we say later. But God is saying now, close yourselves in me and you will go through your days filled with awe. It's true, we know it. Unlike the first invitees, it isn't that we've better things to do. It's that we have so much we must control that we dare not let go even for a banquet. God doesn't ask us to let go of who and what we care about. God wants to be invited into those challenges with us so we will experience the banquet that has been right there all the time. May you find this banquet and find it nourishing and may it lead you through your days in awe at the splendor and beauty of God. Amen.